If you take your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we will be looking at verses 9 to 13. Pick it up in verse 9. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world, or the greedy, swindlers, idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. Now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother. If he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. Let's pray. Our Father, we come now to your word. Lord, we come to be laid bare before, to be examined. Lord, would you work in us, your people, that which is pleasing in your sight. Would you give us hearts to receive your word today, that we would not shrink back from it, that we would love your word, that we would learn to say amen, and that we would walk in true, faithful obedience, that you would be pleased with your people here and how we move forward. Lord, you are our God, and we long to honor you above all else for your glory. Help us now in Jesus' name. Amen. So today we are at Sermon 6 in our series on church discipline. And this morning we are considering how we are to treat or interact with the one who has been removed or excommunicated from the body. What do you do when you cross paths with the one who has been found guilty of unrepentant sin, has been put outside of the church as one we no longer affirm as a Christian? This is an area, I think, that we need some sharpening. We have been foggy in this area, a little dull, and we need to come together under the authority of the Scriptures and hear the Word of the Lord that we may obey it. And as it turns out, the Word of God is not unclear on this issue. But we're going to be challenged today, I think all of us. Last time someone lamented that I didn't start the sermon with telling you to buckle up. Well, buckle up. This question of how to treat the excommunicated is a really difficult one. Not so much scripturally, as we'll see, more so emotionally, volitionally, because we're dealing with real relationships. These are people that you love that you were at one time committed to in Christ, whom you genuinely believed were born again. And of course we want to continue to love them, to care for them. We all want peace in our relationships. But the relationship is fundamentally changed in discipline, so we can't do the same things we once did, because things are not the same as they once were. This person has rejected repentance. They have rejected the Word of God. They have been excommunicated, which means we can no longer commune with them as we once did. And so we cannot relate to them the same as before. Something has changed. So what are we to do? Paul says that to the one who refuses to repent and still calls himself a brother... We are to have nothing to do with him. Now, this is immediately challenging. It's heavy, and it's going to get heavier. We often think that we are to treat them. We often think that we are to treat them as we would treat any other unbeliever that we may meet. 
treat them like any other non-Christian that you come across. But that's not what Paul is saying, is it? He makes it very clear that even though they are to be treated as unbelievers, he makes it very clear that they are not to be treated the same way you would treat other regular unbelievers. Now, how can I say that? Well, because he says you can associate with other unbelievers, but you cannot associate with the excommunicated unbeliever who still calls himself a brother. This is what we just read. Paul says that I wrote to you not to associate with sexually immoral people. And then he says, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world, the greedy, the swindlers. The... If you had to do that, you couldn't live on planet Earth. He's not talking about that. And he says, but now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother. If he is guilty of these things, do not even eat with such a one. Paul has given us two categories of unbelievers. So, Paul says, yes, you can associate with unbelievers, even those who are in great sin. Jesus certainly did all the time. It's one of the reasons people were mad at him, because of who he hung out with. But those who call themselves brother and continue to live in unrepentance, Paul says, have nothing to do with them. You must avoid them. That's what it says. When a profession of faith is shown to be false, the process that we have already spoken of. God calls the church to set the record straight about what he has said about that sin. We are to remove our affirmation of faith from that person. God calls the church to stand up and deny that profession of faith and say it is false. That is not what a Christian looks like. They are not one of us and we are not one of them. Now, already, the very tender-hearted among us are struggling, and it is hard. But stay with me here, and let's keep walking through what the Scripture says. We are a people of the Word. May God give us grace to hear it and say amen. So, we can ask then, is excommunication a matter of simply continuing in the fellowship at some level? continuing to invite them over to our homes for a, a games night or a, a party and generally seek to have some sort of arrangement where the topic is maybe laid aside a little bit, the painful situation is avoided in the name of love. Is that what excommunication is? Well, no, it's not like that at all, is it? We actually have much more detail from Scripture as to what this looks like in this context of excommunication. Remember, this isn't just any unbeliever you might come across, a very specific category that we're addressing. So we've already started off very strong. It's already heavy. And now we're going to dive deep. How are we to treat the one under formal church discipline? What does the Lord say? If you have your inserts in your bulletin, you can pull it out. You will find some verses there that speak to this matter in different ways. What does the Lord say in this situation? Titus 3, 10 and 11. As for the person who stirs up division, after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful. He is self-condemned. 1 Corinthians 5, 5. You are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 5, 2. And you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. 1 Corinthians 5, 11. Now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty, not even to eat with such a one. 1 Corinthians 5.13, purge the evil person from among you. 2 John 1.10, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, what? Do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting. Forever greets him takes part in his wicked works. Romans 16.17, I appeal to you to watch out for those who cause divisions, create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them. All right. 
So we've got to deal with it head on. Here's the biblical summary of how we are to interact with those who have been excommunicated but still claim that title of brother. What did we just read? This is what the Lord says. Have nothing to do with them. Know for certain that they are sinful. Deliver them over to Satan. Mourn. Remove them from your midst. Do not associate with them. Do not eat with them. Do not invite them into your home or give them greeting. Purge them from among you. How does that sound? Does that sound like you should treat them more or less as you used to? Is that muddy? Is that an indistinct trumpet call in our ears? No, not at all. Scripture is quite clear on this. I think what is unclear in all of this is if we are willing to obey or not. There's the struggle. And we'll get to what all of this looks like in real life in a moment, but first we need to address this question of whether we are willing to truly obey what the Word says, even when it is difficult. Because you are going to be tempted to think that you are the exception. I know I am. You're going to think that you're different. You're going to be tempted to do things a little differently and still uh, maintain that relationship with that person, kind of on the side, to comfort them a little bit anyway. I'm going to take on the role of an advocate, a go-between. It's going to be very hard for this person under discipline, so I'm going to take on a bit of a different role, and I'm going to offer them some comfort here. I have a special relationship. This person needs some comfort in this discipline. That's me. I'm going to do that. And we are tempted to think that we are acting in love, but what are we really doing? We are acting in rebellion, aren't we? Ouch. This is hard to hear. But it's hard because this is exactly the temptation, isn't it? To do our own thing and think that it is godly. But can you see it? In this situation... What you end up saying is that even though God says to do this, clearly, we just read it, he says to do this, I'm going to do, I'm going to do that. Even though the word says that this is the way, I'm going to add a few of my own steps into the process, like a little bit of love. And you don't think that you're going to get caught up in the sin, but what you don't realize is that you already are thinking that way, you're already leavened. As the word says, a little leaven leavens the entire lump. And whoever welcomes him takes part in his wicked works, 2 John 1.11. When we think that we are the exception and can offer something on the side, we are distorting the word of God. We are comforting those that we have been called to purge from among us. We muddy the message we end up confusing the sinner. And we are acting in disobedience, so we need to hear this. And this is where we need sharpening. You are not the exception. I am not the exception. And I stress this point because you see this kind of thing happen very often. I feel it. This temptation is real. Someone thinks that they are the exception, so they offer on the side the very fellowship that we are explicitly told not to. Don't do that. And then we go and do it anyway. Isn't that true? You tell your little one not to put the hand on their stove. What are they going to do? They put their hand on the stove. Why do you do that? And when we do that, we offer that which we're not supposed to, the whole process gets confused. Things drag out way longer than needed. It increases the bitterness of the one who was removed. Why doesn't everyone else love me like this person does? This person's loving. Everyone else doesn't treat me this way, right? We've seen that. It is confusing. You're not helping them 
That confuses them, increases the bitterness. It muddies the message of the gospel, the voice of the church, what we are called to do. It is the leavening of the whole lump. And for sure, it comes through the most well-meaning people who really genuinely desire to help. People who care very deeply. It'll often come through such hearts as that, but they are sorely misguided by their emotions and are not being guided by the word, and it works its way through the whole body. Confusion is introduced. Bitterness grows. Remember how we started this sermon series, Love Has Content. That's why we began there. We must not think that we are above the sin and that it won't affect us, that we can make our own path for the sinner to return, aside from the path that God has given us. No, we need to hear this if we're going to get this right. In order to offer the help of God, we must be tethered to the truth, tethered to the truth, reaching out as far as we can, but never letting go of the tether. If you do, there's no way back, and you have nothing to offer. The Word is our authority. So we have established that at this stage of church discipline, the relationship has to change. It has to change drastically. And that we are now to disassociate with that person who is in sin but still claims faith. Now, if this has been hard so far, and you're wondering, I'm going to read that summary again. Thus saith the Lord, have nothing to do with them. Know for certain that they are sinful. Deliver them over to Satan. Mourn. Remove them from your midst. Do not associate with them. Do not eat with them. Do not invite them to your home or give them greeting. Purge them from among you. Hmm. So the question is, what does that look like? What does that mean in real life? Because these are real people, as are we. I'm going to give you three guiding principles to help us navigate these waters. Three things to remember that move us toward our goal of honoring God above all else, guarding the church and the gospel, and moving towards the repentance and reconciliation of that excommunicated individual. That's our goal. Number one, we must take the commands seriously. No getting out of this one. The relationship has changed. Upon the authority of the Word of God, that relationship has changed. And what we have bound here is bound there. On the one side, for the one who remains in sin but still claims to be a brother, they say that a Christian can engage in the way that they're living. God is happy with them, with what they're doing. They're okay. Repentance is not really needed in this situation. I'm okay. Let me be. On the other side... We say that what they're doing is not what a Christian looks like, and if they continue on that path, they are headed for destruction. One looks at the path and says, look, that is a road to heaven. I'm on it. I'm okay. The other looks at that exact same road and says, that is the road to hell. And you are on it. It is not okay. Now, there's no fellowship between these two Points. Light has no fellowship with darkness. This is what it means when it says we are not to be unequally yoked. 2 Corinthians 6.14, which comes from that Old Testament law, not to allow an ox and a donkey to plow together. This separation must be maintained. Now, this means that you must avoid being with this person on that person's terms. We are not to fellowship with them. Now, that's not my word. That is God's word. Therefore, it should become our word. And we learn to submit humbly to it with fear and trembling and say, Amen. Love does not ignore sin. God does not ignore sin. He hates it. He sent His Son 
to be sacrificed for it. It's crucial to understand this in our heart that this is what love looks like. Doing these things in this situation, this is what love looks like. How hard is that to grasp sometimes? This is the content and border of love. We can't escape it. How you interact with that individual has to line up with what we have read, with what the Word says. You can't get away from that. However you interact with that individual, those passages should be in your mind. They must line up. Purge them. Remove them. Do not associate with them now. This is terribly hard. When we started this sermon series, this was the one I feared the most, knowing how difficult it would be, and indeed it is. But we are a people of the Word, and so we must hear it and bend our will and our knees before Him. So this first piece that we're working on, this is the hard one. Hang on. Hang on. We're nowhere near done yet. But for right now, the point of engagement with this person is on the situation and the need for repentance. That's the conversation. We don't have fellowship or association with them outside of that conversation. That is the point of contact. So here's how that can look. Life is messy, but here's an example. Say someone has been removed from the fellowship and they come to church the following Sunday. That often happens, right? They will continue to come here. What does this mean? First of all, let them come. They are welcome here. We are happy to see them walk through those doors. Oh, yes, may they hear the gospel. But what if you cross paths with them? Or they stay for potluck, say. What then? Well... A few men, not everyone, this isn't meant to be an attack, but a few godly men should go to that person and sit with them and start a conversation about the situation. Don't fill your plates. Just go. Talk to them about it. The word is not unclear here. We know what it says. What is unclear is if we will obey it or not. Excommunication has teeth to it. It is going to hurt. It is supposed to. It is supposed to hurt. And we don't let it hurt. We confuse the message. We confuse the sinner. We muddy the gospel. We make a mess as the leaven works its way. The posture of the whole church should be to draw attention to the sin and the need for repentance. That's the point of engagement. We must take the commands seriously. Second thing to keep in mind is that hope remains front and center. Hear this, hear this clear. Excommunication is not a shunning. Let's not get that mixed up. Excommunication is not a shunning. In shunning, there is no road back. You block someone from the path. You ignore them. You cross the street to avoid them. You avert your eyes. That is not what we are talking about. That is not what we are supposed to do. In church discipline, we are, by definition, on the road of hope. This is the means that God has given to win that sinner back. And so we are to be filled with hope, not anger, not revenge or coldness or hard-heartedness, there is a path back, and what we are doing is lighting that path up so that it can be clearly seen. That plane is coming in for a landing in the night. And it's either going to crash or it's going to land safely. What it needs is those lights lit up. What you don't need is 300 people with their own lights running around the runway trying to direct them. He's going to crash. You need the path lit up clear. Whether that pilot likes it or not is irrelevant. 
It needs to be lit up if we're going to be a faithful people. So in the story of the prodigal son, the father in no way associates with his son, right? There's no fellowship. He does not go to him in the pub. He does not go to him in the pig pen. The son is outside of the circle. But is the father cold? Is he disinterested? Has he snuffed out the candle in the window? No. He waits expectantly. And when he sees the first signs of repentance, the return of his son, he runs out to meet him and he receives the repentance of his son. Not just his son in his sin, so that the boy could keep doing what he was doing. He receives the repentance of his son. And that should be our posture, not closed, not cold, not fearful, not angry, not distant, but hopeful, hand outstretched, and not budging. The light must shine and it must not move. The path must be lit up or they will not find their way home. That should be our posture. And then when we do see signs of repentance, we should rejoice. Not be cynical or suspicious. We should rejoice and tell that person, good, here is the path back. Here it is. Go be examined. Remember the sermon where we talked about the court where the evidence was weighed. By their fruits, you will know them. Go back and listen to that sermon if you're wondering how this works. But you tell that person, you see signs of repentance. Good. Go be examined. This comes from the Old Testament. I have leprosy and I have been removed from the community and I'm suddenly better. And I go back in and I tell my buddy, I'm better. Like, I am healed. What's he going to say? Go to the priest and be examined. Go, man. This is awesome. Go, run. Run. There is a process that we have been given, and we must not, we dare not subvert the process or subvert the verdict of the church, blur the lines of the process, or offer any false fellowship. The path home needs to be lit up, and there's only one path home. We must not muddy it. This requires wisdom and a whole lot of courage. So first, we remove the person from our fellowship. Second, we show them how to get home. You have been removed, but here's the way home. This is crucial to understand and put into practice. Removal, show the way back. This is obedience. The path home needs to be lit up. This brings us to our third point. Remember the collateral damage. Very often, the excommunicated person is going to have family, a spouse, children, parents. We must have great compassion for these individuals. They are not the excommunicated. They're not the ones in sin, but they are the ones that have the most difficult task before them. They live with this person, their family, they talk to them, they see them often, daily. They have bonds of relationship outside of the church, God-given bonds that are now confused and in turmoil. We must do better in how we care for these individuals. We must not lump them in with the one who is guilty of sin. We must not treat them as unbelievers. And we must not be afraid to interact with them. Because it's pretty hard. You don't quite know what to do. It's a very difficult task. If there is a spouse, how do you include the one and not associate with the other, right? There's all kinds of questions in different scenarios. It's a very difficult thing to discern. It's going to be hard. We must not shy away from it. We dare not. Those in the family are in an incredibly vulnerable position because of their deep love for their child, their spouse, their parent, whatever. And it's going to be really hard for them, and they will feel really alone. And we need to remember, it is not the church, nor is it God that has created this situation. The weight of this burden belongs on the one who has sinned. 
It is their sin that has done it to their family. It is their sin that has done the damage. And there is real damage that has been done. I can hardly imagine what it must be like for a family member going through this scenario. We must look for ways to include and encourage that family. They're not guilty. We are unable to keep them from suffering. They're in it. We cannot keep them from feeling this pain, but we can walk with them. So, this has all been really hard to hear, and you want to show your love if you're looking for a spot to pour out your compassion in these situations. Here it is. Here it is. This is the spot. Are you doing that? Pour it out on abundance on them. They need it. They're in a really tough season of life, and they need their church around them. And I fear we have not always got this piece right. But by the help of God, we can do better. I can do better. The three parts then are remove the sinner, do not associate, show the way home, light up the runway, and then help the hurting around them. And if I put it that way, it's not really controversial, but it sounds okay. Remove the sinner, show them the way home, help the hurting. That's beautiful. But now we have seen a little bit what that actually looks like and what that's going to take, what it's going to cost. And we are a little bit blown away, and that's a challenge. But may we hear this word, and by the grace of God, seek to obey it. We have one loyalty above all others that cannot be challenged. That is to the living God, and we do that through obedience to His word. If you get that right, the rest will follow. You'll get there. So let me illustrate this then with a, an example that I came across. Say you're headed out for a walk. And on your walk, you pass by your neighbor's house and you note with some alarm that his roof is on fire. So you shout out, Hey, <laughs> your roof is on fire. And your neighbor laughs and says, <laughs> No, it's not. It's fine. Thank you. Have a good day. What do you do? Do you say to yourself, well, he thinks it's fine. I don't want to offend him. I don't want to be a bad neighbor. I want to keep the relationship. So I'll just smile and wave back and carry on my way. Now, what's the problem with that? The problem with that is not just that he doesn't believe that his roof is on fire. You don't either. Walking away while his house is burning down and his life is in danger is not love, no matter how you try to reason that out. If you love your neighbor as you love yourself, you're going to get a whole lot louder, aren't you? Your house is on fire. Look, get out of there. And if he says, well... Let's go inside. It's a tad warm. But let's grab a glass of iced tea and let's talk about it. Listen to my side. You're not going to do that, are you? No, you will do whatever you can to convince them of the truth. There are no sides. There's one conversation that you will be willing to have at that moment and only one. Because you love him. As Christians... We know that hell is real, and it is on fire for all eternity. And those who go there will be in eternal torment. Jesus said that it is a place where the fire is never quenched. Those who refuse to repent don't believe that they're headed for destruction. They don't believe it. They don't believe that their roof is already burning. But we know the truth. And that truth should drive us to do this, not in anger, but in love. We know the way home. 
we know the way out of the burning building. If we truly believe what the word says, then the path suddenly becomes clear. These people that we truly and dearly love are headed for destruction. And it is our duty before God to confront them and call them back. We don't just let them burn. It's a hard word, but it is not unclear, is it? The question before us is not about some ambiguity in the word, some weird translation. The question is one of our obedience. Love for God and love for neighbor are tested in all of us in these matters of church discipline. So in church discipline, when you reach this level, what does love look like? How will you recognize love when it comes to this situation? It looks like this. Have nothing to do with them. Know for certain that they are sinful. Deliver them over to Satan. Mourn. Remove them from your midst. Do not associate with them. Do not eat with them. Do not invite them into your home or give them greeting. Purge them from among you. And we do this in hope. Do not hear despair this morning. This is the path the living God has told us. This is the path. With courage in our hearts, we got to go that path. That's the one. As we love these individuals, God has said, this is where you will rescue them. This is the road home. By the help of God, let us show them the way home. We do this in hope, not in despair. False fellowship on the side saves no one. We need obedience. We need soft hearts to receive a hard word. Hard words bring about soft hearts as we submit to them. What does the word say about discipline? Proverbs 23, 14. If you strike him with the rod, you will save his soul from Sheol. It's supposed to hurt. So remember the three principles. Remove them from your midst and your associations. Always show them the way home. There is grace in abundance. Hope isn't anywhere near extinguished. Light up the way home. Light it up and take care of their family. If we do this, we will be doing well. This is a tough one. there it is. And we hope to wrap up this series in the next sermon where we are going to look at how to welcome a wandering sinner back. Oh, may all our discipline cases have such a happy ending as that. That's the road we're on and we must not wander from it. Stay the course and may we welcome them back to great rejoicing. We'll look at that at the next one. And to that end, we work and may our light shine bright and our hope stand fast for the glory of God and for the purity of his bride. Let's pray. Our Father, this is a hard word, and we are still before you. And Lord, it strikes fear to the heart. And Lord, we pray that you would comfort your people this morning as we look at this, that you would remember us in pity, our weakness, our dust. Show us the way, Lord. We long to be faithful. We long to be those who are willing to do the work, to pay the price. And oh, Lord, we long to see them come home, that we may rejoice together with them again, that we may give you praise to see how you have brought the wandering person home. Lord, we long to rejoice together being faithful so that the gospel is clear and that we love you above all else with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and that we would truly learn what it means to love our neighbor as ourselves.
those inside and those outside. Father, may we be humbled before you. May we leave here not in discouragement, but in hope and even in joy. For your word lights us up and lights our path forward. May we receive it as a body that together we stand up and we stand in the gap in this generation and for those whom we love. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.